All right, we are going to turn over this morning to the book of Philemon. Moving on to something new this morning, we'd like to take a couple of weeks and uh, go through this uh, small letter here. It's considered to be one of Paul's most uh, personal letters, um, but it's rich in detail concerning personal uh, relationships, the spiritual traits and habits that, that bind us. Uh, the way that he wrote the letter uh, shows great courtesy, um, tact, uh, the loving heart that, that we should deal with each other with. Uh, and of course, once you get into the detail and the requests that he makes, uh, you get to see even more about Christian character. Uh, so what we'd like to do this morning is cover the introduction to this, this little letter. Uh, there's only one chapter um, to this letter, cover the introduction and the greeting, and for the introduction this morning, we'll call this um, this lesson that Christian character counts. Okay, Christian character counts. What we like to do is just cover the introduction uh, to this letter. Hopefully, verses one down through verse seven. Let's go ahead and read that this morning. Uh, the letter to Philemon, verse number one, says, "Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother." unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Uh, by way of introduction, that, that's what we'll cover. Number one, the introduction. Um, let's try to cover the who, the what, where, when, and why. Uh, for this letter to Philemon. Of course, the who is the Apostle Paul. He's the author of this book. There's no controversy about that. He identifies himself three different times uh, just in the book. He says in verse number one, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Uh, verse number nine, such as one as Paul the aged. Again, in verse number 19, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. So we know that the Apostle Paul, uh, he who was once a persecutor, of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who was born um, a Hebrew of the Hebrew, grew up trained as a Pharisee, well knowledgeable in uh, the Old Testament and in the traditions of the Pharisees, the traditions of the elders and of the fathers, uh, who spent a good portion of his life persecuting Christians, persecuting that sect that um, had followed this man named Jesus. He himself became a convert, met the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and now he is a believer himself. The Lord has given him a calling as an apostle. He has established many churches. In those churches, there is a man named Philemon that he is writing to. That's the kind of the who of this book. Paul is the author. Philemon is the intended recipient. Now let's cover the what. Uh, the story of Philemon here deals with uh, a young man named Onesimus. Onesimus was a servant or slave of Philemon who lived in Colossae. Uh, Onesimus, this servant, had stolen from Philemon and had fled, fled to Rome. Um, people would say that chance had it this way or fate had it this way. Of course, we know providence had it this way, that while Onesimus was in Rome, he came into contact with the Apostle Paul. And through that meeting and through those conversations and those working, Onesimus has come to be a believer. When you read here in this passage, in verse number 10, he says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. The meeting of Onesimus, the runaway slave, with Paul has resulted in the conversion of Onesimus. He's now a Christian. And for a while, Onesimus stays in Rome with the apostle Paul. He ministers to him. Uh, into his needs there. However, Paul knows that it's the right thing to do to send Onesimus back to make amends with his master to, uh, to right the wrongs of the past in the extent that they could be. And so 
uh, he's going to send him back. And since Tychicus was returning to the province with other letters, like the letter to the Ephesians and the letter to the Colossians, Paul sends this letter and Onesimus to travel with Tychicus so that he can return to Colossae. And this letter was composed to explain the situation to Philemon, to instruct him um, on his runaway servant, to instruct him how he was to receive him back, who was now a Christian. Now the where and when, this was written sometime around 60 AD during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. This is what's called one of the prison epistles. So it goes along with uh, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon are considered to be the prison epistles. This is a companion letter to the letter of Colossians. So these letters would have gone together, uh, one carried by Tychicus, one by Onesimus um, to his previous master Philemon, and they would have traveled together and delivered these letters together. And lastly, the why. And that's what we're going to cover here over the next couple of weeks, the why. This letter was written, of course, first of all, to commend Philemon for his previous showings of Christian love and compassion. Uh, in these first seven verses that we'll try to cover this morning, there's much that Paul is going to emphasize with regard to Philemon and his past, to their past relationship, the things that he's heard about Philemon that, that certainly are a pleasure and a joy to the Apostle Paul. The second reason is to affect the forgiveness and restoration of Onesimus by Philemon. We won't get to that today, but there's a, the, that's the real intent of the letter uh, is to implore for the forgiveness and restoration of Onesimus by Philemon. Um, there's some things at the end, of course, he's going to announce plans for a future visit. He's, Paul's expecting a, a, a short release from that first imprisonment. And so he's making plans for a future visit. And then, of course, at the end, he sends some greetings uh, from different associates that likely Onesa, or Philemon would have known, those ones that are mentioned there in verse 23 and verse 24. Distinctive features in this book. First, again, we say that this is one of Paul's most personal letters. Uh, there's, there's so much that was intended specifically to one person. The relational um, explanation here in this passage, uh, Paul describes the closeness of the relationship that he had with Philemon. Not only was Onesimus saved under the ministry of the Apostle Paul, but it appears that Philemon was as well. And Paul considered both of them to be his children in the faith, considered himself to have a great relationship with them. I don't think that a believer ever truly forgets um, the one that God used as being instrumental in bringing them to faith. Listen, we're, we're, we believe what we believe, and we know that the Scriptures tell us that salvation is by grace through faith. It is 100% a working of grace. It's 100% a working that God did in our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit. He's regenerated us. He convicted us of our sins, gave us new life, gave us the ability to, to, to call upon Him in repentance and faith. And yet you and I both know that there were people uh, and maybe even a particular someone that comes to mind is the one that brought you the gospel, the one that preached the sermons, the one that, you know, maybe it was the, the mother by your bedside or maybe it was the pastor that was preaching. And someone we remember who the Lord used in bringing us to faith, bringing us to hear the gospel. And Paul uh, viewed the relationships that he had with his children in the faith um, as very special to him. And so this letter is very, very much personal. And this letter, secondly, and as far as distinctive features, it's one of the finest examples or illustrations in the Bible of the theological concepts of things like imputation and forgiveness. So we'll cover those uh, as we get further down the road. Verses 1 through 7, let's cover now uh, the salutation. That's all we'll try to shoot for this morning. Verse 1 through 7, Paul's salutation. Verse number 1, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. 
Paul introduces himself, it's interesting here, as a prisoner rather than an apostle. It's interesting because later on in this letter, he's going to make a request. He's going to make an appeal, not on the basis of authority. He's actually going to appeal on the basis of their relationship that they had had previously. It's interesting that he does not present himself yet in this letter as the apostle, but he does consider himself a prisoner, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Paul doesn't often grovel as a prisoner of Rome. He, uh, he often recounts that if he's a prisoner, he knows the cause. The cause was for the Lord Jesus Christ, for preaching the gospel. And that's a worthy cause. If, if the day comes that, that believers, and they, we've seen this in the past, and it's potential that we could see it again in the future. If believers are imprisoned for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is a ba- I'm not saying that it makes it easy, but that is a badge of honor for the Christian to know that, that what he has endured and what he has suffered on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake, that is not something that he has to cower away from, that he has to shy away from or be embarrassed, right? If, if imprisonment comes to believers for the cause of Christ, then um, we, w- we would wear that hopefully as a badge of honor and that we would know we have done this for Christ's sake. Paul, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Timothy's with him. So he's, he's not alone there in prison. Timothy is with him. And he tells us here that the letter is to Philemon, the dearly beloved and fellow laborer. The name Philemon means affectionate. Paul obviously considered Philemon to live up to that name because he considered him a beloved brother, considered him a fellow laborer. In verse number two, it says, And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. I'm going to turn there now because this links us back to the book of Colossians. I've told you that these were companion letters. Let's turn back there real quick. Colossians chapter 4. You'll notice there in Philemon verse 2, he mentions Archippus, the fellow soldier. He is also addressed in the letter to the Colossians at the end of chapter 4. You'll notice in verse 16, it says, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. That's a letter we don't have, but we trust that Paul wrote that as well. Uh, And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. This same chapter back in verse number 7, Colossians chapter 4, verse number 7, it says, All my state shall Tychicus um, declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They shall, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So you kind of see there the link between the, the passages, the link between the letters, Tychicus and Onesimus traveling together. Onesimus is sent with him to deliver these letters, Onesimus being that former servant of Philemon, and then to deliver these letters, to give instruction. Uh, Archippus here is mentioned in both. He apparently had a prominent role in the church there at Colossae in some kind of ministry. I, I don't know, the Bible doesn't indicate, you know, a particular office like pastor or anything like that. It very well could be, but um, he certainly had a role of ministry there. And he tells them there in verse 2 of our text, Philemon verse 2, that Archippus is a fellow soldier. So Paul thought very highly of him uh, and the ministry there at the church of Colossae. So you're, you're left to try to make that connection is, you know, it's obviously in the same region. Potentially Philemon was part of the church of Colossae. Um, you know, you could certainly make that connection. Many do. Uh, but these were obviously companion ideas, companion thoughts and letters that went together. And yet Philemon verse 2 tells us that the church was in his house. Philemon had a church in his house. 
that's, that, meant, that brings to mind a couple of things, of course. Um, of course, it leads us to believe and understand and know that Philemon was from Colossae. He had a church in his house. Um, that kind of reminds us of what a church is. Now, the word church means assembly. Um, that's the way that it's used. That's the way that it's used in the New Testament to, to speak of an assembly. Now, it's not a stretch, okay? This, this is, a, this is a, a logical and direct connection. An assembly, by definition, has to be able to assemble, right? That, that's what a church is. That's what an assembly is. I'll, I'll remind us, I mentioned this, we, we, we use that word as, um, as one of our examples when we were going through our study on basics of Bible interpretation, right? If, if you have an assembly... By definition of the word, it has to be able to assemble. The word church, um, meaning assembly, that's the way that it's used in the New Testament. If you, if you try to supply another meaning for a word, you have to biblically justify why you did that. Example being this word, uh, a church is an assembly. Historically, we, we have not believed, and, and, and of course I say we, I'm talking about Baptist people that believe like we do. By definition of that word, we've never believed what some people believe about the church, right? We've never, believed, we've never expanded the idea of church to be anything larger than that which assembles, right? The assembly of believers. We don't believe that the word church encompasses larger ideas than that. You know, the idea that, well... In one sense, the church can, can apply to, to all believers of all ages. We don't believe that. We don't believe that because we don't see the scripture using the term in that way. Um, when Paul refers to them having a church in his house, it's obviously the speaking of there is an assembly that meets and that gathers together in the house of Philemon. So it's just another example of why we believe what we believe about the assembly about the local church, that which can be assembled and gathered together in a locality. Now, he had a church in his house um, that expresses to us that Philemon opened his home to his church. He opened his, he opened his home to, to that local assembly. Um, you know, there was a time when churches didn't have buildings. They didn't get, you know, they didn't have public property. They didn't have a public maybe worship center or space, even maybe even like we've got, right? We've got a storefront that we're able to meet in and assemble together. There was a time and there was an age where when, when the saints assembled and when they would gather in a specific location, it was often in someone's home. And uh, that, that day has not been too distant in the past. Um, and it may not be too distant in the future that it, that it returns to that. Uh, we've met in a house before, right, during, uh, during COVID when, uh, when uh, that lovely phase of life happened, we met, um, we met at John's house, you know, for, for a handful of weeks. Uh, that didn't change the, the atmosphere of, of worship, the atmosphere of, you know, of, of singing and, and preaching and hearing God's word. You know, we assembled together for the same purpose that we assemble when we have a public place, when we have a storefront or when a church has a building. You know, what we did during COVID and meeting in John's house, that wasn't not church. That wasn't, any, that wasn't lesser church. We still met. We still assembled. We still did the same things that we did when we have a public place. But it is good to know uh, that a man like Philemon, it would certainly be encouraging to know that of, of the saints there at Colossae, here's one that was willing to open his home. Um, does that mean, you know, you, you, you could draw from that a number, of, uh, a number of things. Maybe he had more space. Maybe he had more room. Maybe he was a little you know, a little bit better off and, and had the ability and the means to do that. Certainly you could imply that. Um, it also would be encouraging that one would take the risk of doing that, right? Uh, in an age of potential persecution in the Asian province, um, someone was willing. That speaks well of him, that he was willing to do that. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
such easy verses to pass over, right? Because they're, they're almost without fail in most of Paul's salutations or most of Paul's greetings. But we shouldn't forget that this greeting embodies um, the best that Paul could desire for those that would read his letters. He wanted grace. Uh, you know, God's favor, the un unearned, undeserved favor of God. He wanted that to rest with them. He wanted them to have peace, right? Peace is that what? That spiritual calmness or serenity that stabilizes the lives of Christians. doesn't mean that Christians don't, um, don't have turmoil. It doesn't mean that they don't have trouble. But the Christians do have the potential to realize peace, that, that spiritually stabilizing effect through the highs and lows. You know, that, that while we ride a, mo a roller coaster of maybe emotions at times and we go through um, times of wealth and times of poverty and times of health and times of sickness and, and, and we ride a roller coaster of things and circumstances, spiritually, we can have a, a great calmness about us, about our soul, a great trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's important to, to think about grace and peace being the best that we could desire for people in their situations. I think about this now. I think about that greeting more now with what I see, folks. I'm going to say this, and it's going to sound critical, and I hope you realize it comes with the right attitude. I don't know what in the world good vibes are when people wish them to each other, right? Somebody could go through something, Somebody could have um, a tragedy or go through a loss. You know, hey, you just, just recently got a bad report from the doctor. And somebody will comment, oh, sending good vibes your way. What does that even mean? I, I, don't, I don't know what that really means. I, I get what it means in, in you know, the, the common language of the day. But there, there's not much with that. You know, there, there's not much with that. That doesn't, to me, equate or even compare to to someone that would come back and say, you know what, I've been praying for you, and I've been praying for your grace. I've been praying for God's grace, for, for peace and comfort. Um, that, that, to me, expresses so much more. Um, you know, Paul doesn't necessarily wish people health, wealth, and happiness, but he does wish all of his followers the grace of God and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And there's some substance to that. That's, those are the best that he could desire for them. And he certainly does. Whenever Paul thought of Philemon, he was thankful. He says in verse 4, I thank God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Whatever their relationship in the past, Philemon has made a great impression on the Apostle Paul. Um, his compassion, the, the opening of his home to fellow believers, to the assembly there that they could meet in his house, um, hearing verse number five of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. What Philemon has done in the past has made an impression on the apostle, uh, the apostle Paul. It mattered to him. When, when Philemon acted in the acts of love and compassion and grace toward his fellow believers, toward those that were around him, that meant something to the apostle Paul. Those acts don't go without notice. I'm thankful for you, and I mention you when I pray. He mentions the love and faith there in verse number five. Faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, love toward people. I think that's something that um, we, we can recognize. I don't think that it's wrong to, to recognize people, even if they're just doing what they're supposed to do, right? Now, you, you're supposed to love. That, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to have love towards our fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that's actually the way the Bible tells us the world knows that we're people of the Lord Jesus Christ. By this shall all men know you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. Um, in the book of 1 John, I'll actually turn and read this one. If you turn to 1 John chapter 5, when you start reading here on, on the topic of assurance and John starts to label out the marks of a believer... One of the ones that he mentions is the love that the brethren have for each other, the, the love that a Christian should have for other Christians. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. If you've put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're one of his, right? But what does the rest of verse 1 say? And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. 
So if you're going to say, well, you know, I am begotten of the Father, right? We are born of God. And I love him that begat me. I love the Lord. Well, if you love him that begat, what's it say? You also love those that are begotten of him. A Christian that, that claims to love the Lord Jesus Christ, to love God, it necessarily follows that he loves others that, that are born of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we use the term brother and sister um, not in a, in, a, in a fleshly way. It is obviously in a spiritual way. We have the same father. We, we, you, you and I are, are kindred um, in faith in Lord Jesus Christ, and, and we, we ought to love each other. And Paul recognized when individuals and when churches followed up what they expressed as their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by love to the brethren. He saw one leading to the other, right? The, the entire book of James, which I know obviously Paul didn't write, but when you read through the book of James and it's obviously built on the concept of, of real faith producing something, right? Faith without works is dead. Real faith produces uh, a working and a lifestyle. Paul recognized the same thing. Look quickly in Ephesians chapter 1. I'll notice that, that Paul mentions the same things in multiple letters. That he recognizes that folks that claim faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the first expressions of that is in the love that they show to others. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love unto all saints. Same thing he wrote to Philemon. How about Colossians chapter 1? Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 3. Colossians 1 verse 3, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all saints. So that's, that's a good reminder for us, right, that those, those go together. Um, if, if you claim faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but I can't stand those church people, those, those two thoughts don't go together. Right? The, uh, the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ produces a, a love also, um, a special love for those that are begotten by him, a love for fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, as a Christian, there is a degree in which our love encompasses all those that are around us. Uh, our love for our neighbor, uh, our desire to preach the gospel, to share it with him, to see our neighbors come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that should be a real desire that we have. I'm talking about that special, that particular bond and relationship that believers have with each other um, that, that overlooks pettiness and, and, and the nuisances of personalities. And there's a real heartfelt bond and connection because we know we are part of the same family that what God did in my life, he did that in your life too. And immediately there is a bond that we have with each other that's so much greater than I work with this guy or this is the guy that always bags my groceries. There is a bond that we have that, that, is, that is so close because God did the same things in our lives. And that's a, that's a peculiar relationship that, that means something. And Paul recognized when other people saw it that way too and lived accordingly. Now back to our text, verse number 6. Philemon, verse number 6. And this is the occasion of the letter because thus far he's not been specific. Maybe in a sense, okay, you've opened your home to believers, but, you know, I'm thankful for you. You, you, you've done well, you've shown love to others, but notice verse 6, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. This is the occasion of the letter. He's going to give him another way to communicate that faith. That's what the word communicate means there in that passage. Sometimes we use the word communicate and we're just talking about the way we talk with each other. That word communicate gives with it the idea of, of a giving, a relaying, a sharing, a way to share that faith. You learn in the Bible, Paul uses that word often uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 
um, verse number 18, he speaks to those that are rich in this world, that they um, be willing to communicate with others, that they would share, they would give of their abundance. Uh, in the book of Galatians chapter 2, verse 2, he uses the word communicate when he talks about his acts of sharing the gospel. When we talk about sharing our faith then, according to verse number 6, the communication of thy faith becoming effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing, the sharing of our faith encompasses more than just us telling other people the gospel. Now, that is the basis, right? And that is the base responsibility for every believer is to share the gospel. But when we talk about communicating or sharing uh, of who we are, um, there, there's so much more than that. There's the relationships that, that we have with people. There's the effort that we put forth in the service of Christ. The way that we communicate or share or do um, speaks volumes. So it's more than just the gospel. There is an expectation that the believer would go above and beyond even that. Christianity is not a minimal effort proposition. Okay, this is not, um, okay, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven someday, my base responsibility is to stay out of trouble and tell, the, tell a few folks the gospel, and I'm in the clear. Um, that's a starting point. That, that's a real good starting point for believers. Try to stay out of trouble, try to share the gospel. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, in fact, um, James, when he's talking about what religion is, he talks about things like, you know, if a man claims to be religious and he can't bridle his own tongue, that ain't religion. And then he talks about how pure religion and undefiled is the, is the man that um, visits the widows and the fatherless and the affliction and keeps himself unspotted from the world. Alongside with the staying out of trouble, you, you should do things, right? It's Christianity is not just about what we're trying to not do. It's about what we're trying to do and be faithful uh, to communicate as such. And this letter is going to be one such way that Philemon can express um, his faith. He can communicate uh, his faith um, in these good things through the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, verse 7, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Listen, this mattered to Paul, and it mattered to other people. The life that a Christian lives matters, not just our testimony before the lost. That matters. We certainly want to have a great reputation and great testimony so that when we try to witness to unbelievers, we don't come off as hypocrites or we don't come off as fakes. Um, but we also want to live such a life that, that, that makes a difference and starts to matter to others, other believers. When Paul writes in the first few verses, you can tell that what Philemon has done in the past matters to him. He had heard about it. According to verse number five, I've heard of thy love and thy faith. What things that Philemon has done has spread and they mattered to Paul. And then Paul also relays there at the end of verse number seven, the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee. It mattered to people. Whatever we do on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ for other people, don't think that that stuff doesn't matter. Please don't think that those things are insignificant. E even if it's what you think is just a small thing, right? Um, a few bucks, take somebody out to lunch, you know, send someone a card, bring somebody some flowers, cook somebody a meal. Don't think those things are insignificant. The things that you do is a help and a blessing to other people. Paul's like, those things matter. And maybe, you know, maybe others have never found the words to, to express that to Philemon, what, you know, things he has done meant to them. But Paul, in one, one swoop here, just says that we have great joy and consolation in thy love. The bowels of the saints, are, you have you've done great things that have mattered and helped a lot of people. And it meant the world to the Apostle Paul. So listen, Christian character counts. It matters. It matters when we try to go witness to others. It matters in just the relationships that we have with the people we go to church with. Trying to live faithfully, trying to be a help and trying to be a blessing. Maybe you think your work and your efforts go unseen. 
Paul says, I'm thanking God for you, and I pray for you, and I mention you by name, and other people have told me about what you've done, and you've been helping, and you are a great blessing to many others. Um, and it meant the world to the Apostle Paul. All right, let's go ahead and quit there, and we'll get into the request next week. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your